Hello. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, shall shall I start now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, respected Dr. Dipankar Maithi, Director uh, National Rice Research Institute, and today's speaker, Professor Michael Purukanan uh, from New York University, all head of the division, scientists and personnel from NRRI and other ICR institutes, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening and warm welcome to today's Platinum Jubilee Lecture. And obviously, good morning to Professor Michael Purugana. Uh, uh, as per the formality, I will brief you about the Institute and the lecture series. As you know, if you could recollect the past, the horrible year 1943, we witnessed the suffering from the Great Bengal Famine. The famine caused around 2.5 million deaths due to starvation, due to food scarcity. One of the major causes of the famine was identified as the devastating rice fungus that led to serious shortage of rice grain in the Bengal province. Government of India then realized the importance of rice in this area and decided to intensify research in all aspects of rice crop. As a result, government established the Central Rice Research Institute on April 23, 1946. Dr. K. Ramaya, who was an eminent rice breeder, was its founder director. And this Central Rice Research Institute has been recently renamed as National Rice Research Institute. Since then, the Institute has been tirelessly working on all researchable aspects of rice crop and has made significant contributions towards enriching the rice science and ensuring food security of the country. The seeds of Green Revolution were first planted at the field of this institute and spread to the rest of the country. Till now, the institute has released uh, around 148 varieties and developed numerous crop production technologies, multiple methods to safeguard rice from diseases and pests, and continuously helping farmers by providing assistance whenever they need. NRRI has a total of five different divisions, crop improvement divisions, crop production division, crop protection division, crop physiology and biochemistry division, and social science division. We also have three regional research stations located at three different states of India. Additionally, two Krishi Vigyan Kendras, which is also in uh, literally, if I translate, it would be agricultural knowledge center are also managed by NRRI. The first brick of this institute was laid in 1946, and we are now completing 75 years of our glorious presence this year, 2021. As part of the long celebrations, NRRI is also organizing Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series, and these lectures are to be delivered, and has been delivered by outstanding personalities of the country and abroad. First lecture has been delivered by a fellow of Royal Society, Professor Pete Smith from UK. Second lecture was delivered by Swami Atma Priyanandaji, Pro-Chancellor, Ramkrishna Mission Vivekananda Educational and Research Institute, Kolkata. Day before yesterday, Dr. Anita Savat has delivered the third lecture on geographical indications or GI. For the fourth lecture, we are here today we are immensely glad to have with us Professor Michael Puruganan, who is the Silver Professor of Biology at New York University. You know, origin of rice has long been debated. Professor Puruganan would take us to revisit the debate and enlighten us with his research experience in crop domestication and evolution of crop species, especially rice. He will talk about today on the topic, the origin and spread of rice. We are indeed excited to listen to you, Professor. Not taking further time, I would like to request Director NRRI, Dr. Dipankar Maithi, to chair today's event. Thank you. I, 
Uh, I request now uh, Dr. B.C. Patra, who is the chairman of this Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series Organizing Committee and also head of Crop Improvement Division, to welcome and introduce the speaker to the audience. Good evening, everyone. And good morning to Professor Michael. So uh, I have the privilege to introduce Professor Michael Purugannan. He is a Silver Professor of Biology and former Dean for Science at New York University. He is well known for his research on plant evolutionary genomics, domestication and evolution of crop species, especially rice. He joined the New York University as a faculty in 2006. And before that, he was the distinguished professor of genetics at North Carolina State University. In 2005, he was elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was also awarded the 2015 Khalifa International Dead Palm Award. He serves as an editorial board member in various journals of plant biology and evolu evolutionary genetics such as genome biology and evolution, molecular ecology, trends in plant science, and the annual review of ecology, evolution, and systematics. Professor Purugannan is a trustee of the Alfred Sloan Foundation. His team has been doing pioneering molecular research work on the origin, evolution, and domestication of cultural rice with special reference to sticky and aromatic rice. Currently, his team is working on evolutionary changes in gene expression in response to environmental factors. With these few words, I again, once again, welcome Professor Michael Purugunan to Indian audience and also some, some of the uh, visitors are there from other countries, other states also. I find some other uh, ICA directors also are uh, attending this meeting. I see Dr. Anita Kaurun, Director CPCRI Kasargod, Kerala, she is there. And also Professor Pesi Bansal, former director of uh, NBPGR. He is also attending, sir. We welcome you all, sir. Thank you, sir. Now over to Kutu. Okay, so now uh, this is time to listen to our today's speaker, Professor Michael Purvana. Over to you. Okay. First of all, uh, let, let me let me share my screen. Um, share, and then I'm just going to go. So can can people see my slides? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's good, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, the only sad thing is I really wish I were there. I was just um, telling my wife, I, we had never been to India before and it's one of our great um, uh, ambitions to visit India and to visit NRRI and to talk to colleagues there. So I hope I can do that once the pandemic is over. In fact, you can count on it that I will be going and visiting you once the pandemic is over because it would be great to interact personally with um, um, uh, my colleagues there in, in India and to see if there are some work we can do together in the future. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so before I start, I'd like to introduce you a little bit about my, you know, thank you for the kind introduction. I'll, I'll just introduce you a little bit about my lab. So this is, uh, if some of you recognize, this is the island of Manhattan. And um, my lab is right somewhere there. As you can tell, it's a very agricultural environment uh, here. We actually, as I say, we're the, we're the um, we are the um, biggest grower of rice on the island of Manhattan in New York. We harvest about one kilo of rice a year in our greenhouses. So that makes us the largest rice producer in New York. Um, and the work is done here at the uh, New York University Center for Genomics and Systems Biology, which uh, was a center that I helped start uh, um, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, 14 years ago now. And in case you don't know New York University, because many of us, of course, who work on plants, we know the agricultural universities, but New York University is not known for its agricultural work. But I'd like to introduce you to, to you. New York University was founded in 1831. It's the largest private university in the United States. And the thing about it that's also unique, it's, it's a global network university. That is New York University has three major campuses where it grants degrees. The, the main campus in New York City we also have a campus near you in Abu Dhabi, um, NYU Abu Dhabi, which I also am affiliated with, uh, and we'll see a little bit about that later on. And we also have a campus in Shanghai, so NYU Shanghai, 
Um, so students can go to either New York, Abu Dhabi, or Shanghai. And we also have small campuses around the world. We have, we, unfortunately, we don't have any, any place in India. The closest is Abu Dhabi. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a university that's uh, ranked fairly highly in the world. Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, it's not that well known for its work in plant biology, but I think that's changing, um, as I hope you agree. Uh, and, as I, and, and the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology, where I'm a member of, we have uh, two locations. We have in New York City and Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and I, in fact, um, are, are in both of those centers and do work in uh, both of those centers. So a, a large, as, as, as has been mentioned, I, I work uh, a large part in evolutionary biology. And my work has focused in the last 15 years on how crops evolve in general. Um, because there, there are two reasons for this. Um, one reason is that uh, Darwin himself, one of the founders, uh, the father of modern evolutionary biology, thought of crops as a very good system to study how evolution worked. Um, he looked at crop systems both to understand how variation occurred in nature, but also, as many of you know, <clears throat> he looked at crops as a way to understand how natural selection occurred, because he looked at the role of breeders in artificially selecting different crop varieties as an analogy to natural selection, which he said occurs in nature by itself. And it was because of this that Darwin was able to formulate his major uh, ideas on the, uh, the origin of species and the role of natural selection in evolution. And so my laboratory is very interested in trying to use crop evolution as a way to understand how um, evolution in general has occurred. But the other reason we're interested in crops is that we feel that by understanding how crops evolve, how their traits have changed over time, how they've adapted to different local environments or changes in climate, we may be able to find genes that crops have used to adapt to these different environments and to evolve in the past and maybe help breeders, although we are not breeders ourselves. We hope that this information can help breeders and give them ideas on how they can proceed to develop new crop varieties that may be important in new challenges that we face going forward. Um, so let's start off by looking at uh, crop evolution. So in general, crops, the crops that we cultivate are relatively new species. All domesticated animal and plant species have evolved only in the last 12,000 years, um, with the exception of the dog. Dog probably evolved 30,000 years ago. But every other plant and animal species that we farm or cultivate or we herd as animals uh, or keep as pets um, probably evolved only in the last 12,000 years. And they evolve, they evolve primarily in, and, and, and this happened um, around the world um, in independent areas. So for example, the oldest uh, evidence for agriculture is as many of you know, the Fertile Crescent uh, in uh, an area that spans Iraq, Turkey, and into the Levant. This is where the oldest evidence of agriculture is found and the domestication of crops such as wheat, um, barley, uh, uh, lentils, oats, and rye, uh, and other um, flax, for example, were cultivated in this area. We also know that, uh, that, that humans uh, started agriculture separately in other parts of the world. So in China, they started to develop millets. Um, there was also, of course, the development of agriculture in the Indian subcontinent. And in the New World, which remember, was not linked after 12,000 years ago to the Old World, the New World also started to um, uh, domesticate different crops. Um, it's actually still not clear why human societies starting 12,000 years ago changed their behavior so that instead of being hunters and gatherers as a being hunt, hunting and gathering as the primary way in which they, um, uh, they took their food um, in the wild, they started to actually settle down and plant crops as a way to nourish themselves. Um, anthropologists are still not sure why this happened and it happened worldwide. But what this led to was the evolution, as I said, of different crop species around the world that evolved uh, in the last few millennia, which are now important for human survival. And it's these crop species and their recent evolution that 
my group and others around the world are studying. So we actually look at two different model systems. Uh, one is Arisa Sativa, as you're all familiar, Asian rice. And of course, many of you are also familiar with Arisa Globarima, which is African rice. Um, so that's the work that's done primarily in my laboratory in New York City. In Abu Dhabi, my other laboratory, um, where I have a small group, we actually work on the evolution of another crop that actually also grows, I think, in India, in a small portion, uh, which is Phoenix dactylifera, which is date palms. So both of these crop species are um, species that I work with, but I would say 80% of our work or 75% of our work is on Asian rice. Um, that's where most of uh, my work is focused on. And I don't need to explain rice to, of course, this audience. You're all familiar with rice. It's a primary calorie source of the world. It uh, feeds more than half of the world's population. Uh, and it has a modestly sized genome of 400 megabases, which allows us to do much of the genomic work um, that my group does. So as you know, just in, in I guess that's a big overview, Arisa sativa um, probably evolved from Arisa rufi pogon uh, approximately 9,000 years ago. And in Africa, Arisa globarima evolved from Arisa barthei about 3,000 years ago. The details of the evolution, the origin of these species and their evolution is still the subject of a lot of study. Uh, and that's something that I hope my laboratory has been able to contribute to. So one of the first things we did in this work, and we started working in rice really only about um, uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, and one of the first things we did was we wanted to look at genomic diversity of rice across the rice genome, especially looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms. Now, remember this was done about um, 15 years ago and 15 years ago, sequencing whole genomes was still a challenge. Um, and so what we did was um, we took a group of about 120 rice varieties, as well as Oriza rufi pogon and Oriza meridionalis and barthii. And we sequenced about 100 gene fragments throughout the genome and used that information to try to understand the relationships between rice. And what we found was something that, of course, everybody knows. It's, it, this is not something new. We found, of course, that there seems to be two major subspecies or genetic groups of rice. Uh, one group is Indica and Aus that group together. And the other group is Jamot, Japonica and the aromatic rices, which group together. Now, as I said, this is something that had been known for some time. It was not something that was new to us. It was just good that data from the genome, single nucleotide polymorphism data, was able to confirm this. And as you know, because the, of the genetic distinct, uh, distinctiveness of these two different groups, it had been suggested that rice um, originated twice. One, Japonic and aromatic probably in East Asia and China, and Indica and Aus uh, probably in India. And that was a, uh, a model that had been, uh, the, 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 uh, that um, had been uh, thought of as true for a long time. Uh, and as I said, so the model is, but, but, but from our work, which I'm not going to summarize this work about 10 years ago now, um, we think what, what, what's happened is actually a little more complicated than that, but no less interesting. We think that Japonica rice um, was domesticated first in the Yangtze Valley in China approximately 9,000 years ago. And there's really good archaeological evidence to back this up uh, from work by Dorian Fuller at University College London. Um, so Japonica rice, we think, was domesticated first 9,000 years ago. And uh, well, it started to appear 9,000 years ago, um, beginning 8,000 years ago, it started to proliferate. And it actually took about um, uh, several thousand years before rice became fully domesticated. So what this is, is a plot of the percentage of non-shattering grains found in the archaeological record in rice remains uh, in China. Uh, and you can see that it, ta it, it, it takes you know, several thousand years, about 3,000 years, before you get to see rice in fields that are nearly 100% non-shattering. And non-shattering is our indication that uh, rice is domesticated. So it, it, it took quite some time. Uh, but over that period, what happened was Japonica um, uh, evolved uh, and became the rice that spread through much of East Asia. Uh, and India, what, what we think, again, this is, this is still a theory. Um, we think that rice was being used. It was even being harvested as wild rice. And as many of you know, that's still being done in some provinces in India where wild rice is harvested for food. Or the, people were beginning to cultivate it. And I call it, we, we call it a proto-Indica because it had not yet been domestic, we, we think, okay, it had not yet been domesticated. That is, 
um, it, it's, it, it, it still could shatter um, and, and it was not being used at a, a high amount. This is about 8,000 years ago. But about 4,000 years ago, we think that Japonica rice made its way to India, uh, probably by the Silk Road. Uh, route. And it, it made it actually coming in, we think, from the Northwest. There's good archaeological evidence to think it came in from the Northwest. And the arrival of Japonica to India, the, 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 the traditional farmers of India were very clever. They took the Japonica rice that they saw coming in from Japan, China, but instead of just using it, they cross hybridize it with the rice that they were developing there in India. The, these, uh, we could call them the early breeders uh, 4,000 years ago. And in doing so, what they did was they introduced domestication alleles that had come from Japonica into India. They developed this new variety, Indica, which was the one that spread throughout the world. And as we now know, Indica is responsible for 80% of the world's rice production. So the early Indian farmers took something from China, made it better, and that led to the spread of Indica um, throughout much of uh, production in Asia uh, right now. And there's a lot of evidence for this. Uh, we did a, 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 a evolutionary genomic modeling in 2017, where what we suggested that rice had two origins, one in India and one in China, but domestic, the, the, the original domestication occurred in China and then hybridization and regression, that is movement of alleles. And we say there's about 15 to 17% um, gene flow into India and possibly secondarily into ours, uh, was one that, that um, allowed um, Indica rice to flourish and to become the dominant rice variety. Um, in Asia uh, today. Uh, and, and, and so the, the model we now have, as I said, is Japonica uh, originated in India, Indica uh, in, in, in oh, I'm sorry, Japonica in China, Indica in India, and Japonica provided the domestication alleles into Indica, um, but, but, but Indica provided many of the other high yielding traits that made Indica the dominant rice uh, subspecies that's grown throughout the world today. Uh, and there's other uh, pieces of evidence for this. Um, right after our first paper, which discussed this in 2011 and 2011 in PNAS, the Beijing Institute of Genomics in 2012 had a paper in, uh, in uh, Nature, where they actually also suggested the same thing, where they said domestication alleles appear to, uh, in, in indica rice appear to come primarily from uh, Japonica, and they have a model similar to ours. Uh, and the only difference is that they believe that rice was domesticated in Southern China. We don't believe it was Southern China. We believe it was in the Yangtze Valley, some, uh, in the middle uh, Yangtze Valley. Um, and again, archeologically that makes sense. Most of the archeological remains do indicate that it was the Yangtze Valley where uh, we begin to see uh, rice evolution. So th that's kind of what we now know about the domestication of rice. Um, I, I will say at this point that while I think there is a greater acceptance of this model now, it is still not completely settled. Um, there are still um, scientists, rightly so, who think that the model is uh, of multiple domestications is still valid. Uh, for example, uh, Peter Sivan uh, and uh, Terence Brown in the, in the United Kingdom think that. Um, I think the data uh, points to the model that uh, we have proposed, and I think more work uh, may finally settle this question uh, in the coming years. But my group has actually started to move away from the question about the origins of rice. And we've now become really interested in the question of how rice has spread after its domestication event. That is, once you were domesticated, the domestication events occurred in a fairly localized geographic area, um, either in the Yangtze Valley in China or maybe the Ganges Delta in India. Uh, but then after you start to develop full-blown domesticated rice, how does it spread and adapt to different environments? Because obviously the area around the Yangtze Valley is very different from say Indonesia or from Japan especially, um, which is a more temperate climate. Um, and so several years ago, we started to, to try to do this. And, and I think this is now becoming a, an, an interesting area in the study of crop evolution because uh, if you think about it, the evolution and the, move, the movement of crops throughout the world is associated possibly with the migration of humans as they've also moved around in different environments around the world. Uh, and it might also tell us something about cultural interactions 
about adaptation to different climates or day lands, uh, different soil environments, and also biotic env environments. How do um, uh, crops uh, go to a new environment and encounter new insect pests, for example, or new bacterial and fungal pathogens? And how does it develop resistance to those? So there are many questions uh, associated with the movement and the spread of crops from their centers of origin. So we started this work about three years ago where um, we took the 3000 genome project where there was a sequencing, as you know, of 3000 rice genomes uh, throughout the world. Um, and we were able to identify 1,265 land races from that project. And of course, <laughs> and of course uh, in the study of uh, in the study of um, uh, rice evolution, we look at land races and not elite varieties. So we we use 1,265 land races from the Free K Genome Project and several land races we also sequence uh, from our laboratory. And we 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 sequence the genome to about uh, approximately 10x coverage. Um, and then we did a lot of bioinformatics to filter down that data uh, for quality. Uh, and also um, subset the data that are used in different analysis. So depending on what analysis we use, we, we look at different types of data uh, in this for looking at uh, population clustering, uh, to look at um, uh, population relationships, for example. So this is just the bioinformatics pipeline. And, and it's, a very, it's, it's a very involved pipeline when we did this, but now uh, we can easily do this with different uh, varieties. So, so we have approximately 1,443 land races, both India, Indica primarily in Japonica. Um, and when we do a PCA analysis, what we find, not surprisingly, is we find three major groups of, um, uh, of rice. Uh, here on the upper left is Indica, on the upper right is Japonica, and here at the bottom actually um, is, is uh, house rice. Um, and um, what I'm going to focus on primarily in the next few minutes is Japonica rice, which is found here. And here on the lower left is where the samples of our Japonica rice comes from uh, that we used in uh, this analysis. By the way, this was published last year in Nature Plants. So if you look at just Japonica rice, what you do is you take this principal components analysis and look at this and just blow this up. So zoom in on it. What you see is that the, uh, even within Japonica, you see distinct clusters of Japonica land races. And actually these distinct clusters um, are associated with clear geographic locations of where these land races come from. Um, and so for example, um, we have a group of rice here that is found in Northeast Asia, primarily Japan, Korea. And they're the temperate, uh, uh, they're the temperate Japonica rices. Um, we have uh, the, the Southeast Asian rice from the mainland um, in, in uh, uh, from the mainland in Southeast Asia. This is primarily from Laos, um, our samples. Uh, and we also have, this one it says India, but this is actually a Bhutan sample. We also have samples from Bhutan here. And then we have here, over here, the island, um, uh, the island Southeast Asian uh, Japonica rices, some of them from Indonesia here, and these here from the Philippines. Um, so we're able to look at uh, rice variation in a geographical scale, and we can see that they seem to be grouping very well with geography, which already tells you that there does not seem to be a large amount of movement and gene flow between these geographic areas. That's not true that there's none, there is actually gene flow between them, but there's enough of uh, uh, an adaptation to specific geographic locations that their geographic signature is still found. Um, okay, and this by the way shows you a map of, uh, of, of Asia where these groups are, the Northeast Asian uh, temperate rice, the mainland Southeast Asian, the island Southeast Asian rice and so on. Um, hold on, I'm having a hard time. Okay. Now, one of the things you can do with these geographic locations is you can use, what we do in our lab a lot is we use techniques that we get from human genetics and human genomic analysis. So, so you know, there's been a lot of um, work that has been done to try to look at the relationships between human populations and to look at reconstruct human history and human migration. And in my lab, we use a lot of those techniques and we apply it to rice. And this is one of them. This is what's called the admixture graph technique. 
It's a way to look at relationships between these populations. But instead of doing a simple phylogeny, the admixture graph technique actually allows you to also model um, hybridization events, okay? And so this is kind of the model that we found uh, most, uh, uh, most significant in our analysis where you can see the relationships of, uh, of different populations and also hybridization events that give rise to certain, certain um, populations uh, as mixtures of other um, rice land races. Now this is a little bit complicated. So what I'm going to do? Is, uh, oh, and 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 um, by the way, when we took this data, we we have this data from the genome analysis, but we collaborated with archaeologists. And what archaeologists have done is they have made a map of Asia, and they've looked at where rice remains have been found in Asia in different times uh, in the past. So 9,000 or 8,000 years ago, most of rice remains are found uh, of Japonica. This is uh, this is Japonica are found primarily in. Uh, China, and then you start to see it spread between 8,000 and 7,000 years ago, and so on, until finally, you know, in the last thousand years, Japonica can be found um, all over um, Asia. So this is based on archaeological data, and we also use that data in our analysis. So what I've taken is I've taken the admixture graph I've showed you, and I've tried to simplify and tried to we've tried to put it on the map of East Asia to try to show a model for how we think um, Japonica rice has spread and also the timing of when these occurred. And in timing this, we use a method called um, um, the sequentially Markovian coalescent. It's a population genetic genomics analysis where you take genome sequences, um, pairs of genome sequences, and you're able to look at the time to the most recent common ancestor. And we use that in our analysis here as well. And here in the lower left, you can see the distribution of what we think the time is of divergence of different populations of Japonica. So this is very complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it more simple, simpler and walk you through the different parts of this graph. So as I said, our model thing domestication started about 9,000 years ago in uh, the Yangtze Valley here this location here in the Yangtze Valley. That's where we think from the archeological record. This is just based on archeological record. We think rice um, started to be domesticated. In our genomic analysis, the first split is temperate and tropical Japonica, where the tropical Japonica gave rise to a Japonica rice that went down to mainland and island Southeast Asia and temperate rice was went to Northeast China, Korea, Japan, um, and some into Taiwan. Um, and dating that we think this occurred sometime between 4,100 and 2,500 years ago. That is when we think the split of temperate and tropical Japonica rice occurred. Uh, and this is actually, uh, when we saw this date, we weren't sure what it meant. But then when we talked to several of our um, archaeological colleagues, they got very excited by this date. Because here's another way, to, I'm sorry, this is another way to look at it. This is the distribution of uh, times based on our genomic analysis for when we think tropical and temperate Japonica split. Uh, and we think it started to split, I said, 4,200 years ago. You can see that in tropical Japonica, this is, uh, this is again using the genome, we can look at the effective population size. It is very high until about 4,000 years, 200 years ago, where you see a sudden decrease in rice cultivation in Asia. And for a few thousand years, maybe a thousand years, uh, the effective population of rice remains low and just starts to recover after that period of time. Now, this is interesting because paleoclimatologists actually know what happened during this period in time. This is a period in time that has been called by paleoclimatologists as the 4.2K event. This is a period of time where temperatures actually, which were fairly high around the world, started to go down over a period of time. And so the globe, uh, the planet started to cool down. And this is at the same period of time, as I said, where we begin to see the divergence of temperate and tropical Japonica. So we think this cooling event, this 4.2K event, may have been responsible for the early diversification of Japonica rice into temperate and tropical groups. This just shows you a map. This is a reconstruction based on one of our colleagues, Jay Guedes at UC San Diego. She's an archaeologist and paleoclimatologist. And what she did was she took the, the, 
the, the requirement for growing tropical japonica uh, in terms of growing degree days. And see, she asked herself, if I look back in time, where could tropical japonica rice grow in Asia? And here, if you see the, uh, the, the yellow and green colors, these are areas where tropical japonica could have grown 5,000 years ago. It could grow all the way up north because the weather was suitable for growing tropical japonica up north. Everywhere in Asia, except really the Tibetan Plateau was suitable for rice. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this movie. And as you go forward in time, you're gonna to start to see darker colors. And where darker colors appear, those are areas where tropical japonica can no longer grow well. And in fact, the only ones that can grow in those areas are what we now consider temperate japonica. So let me start this movie. So it's now about 5,000 years ago, and you can start to see there was a minor cooling actually about 5,000 years ago where the north started to cool um, and tropical japonica can no longer grow. But then it kind of goes back a little bit. And then this is the 4.2K event. This is what happened starting 4,200 years ago. You can see after 4,200 years ago now, tropical japonica's uh, growth is pretty much restricted to Southern China, Southeast Asia, and India. Um, tropical japonica can no longer grow in Northeast China and Korea and Japan. And in order for rice to grow in that area, we think temperate japonica had to evolve in order to colonize those areas. So that's where we think uh, this model grows, uh, shows you. And if you look at the archeological record, you see that as well. So between 9,000 and 4,200 years ago, this is where you see archeological remains of japonica rice. Um, here in this area, that's fairly far north. It's between the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers and as far north as the Shandong Peninsula of China. But after 3,500 years ago, you see that the rice is now in Southeast Asia and also Northeast Asia. This is the temperate japonica. There's actually very little um, tropical japonica now in the middle. This is when indica actually comes in. So that is what we think happened for the split of temperate and tropical japonica. That was the first thing that occurred. Then right after that, you see the spread of um, tropical japonica to island Southeast Asia. Uh, and we think that this occurred, um, the, the split of rice from mainland to island Southeast Asia occurred sometime between 2,500 to 1,600 years ago based on our analysis. And even within Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia, it occurred at about the same time. Now, these numbers are a little tentative. Uh, we actually have more recent evidence that think this may have occurred much earlier that the spread into Southeast Asia, into island Southeast Asia may have occurred as early as 3,000 500 years ago, um, and hopefully future analysis will allow us to determine this. But it occurred after the temperate and tropical split. So let's call it somewhere between 3,500 to 2,500 years ago, you start to see spread into Southeast Asia. And that's actually interesting because actually in Southeast Asia, prior to 3,200 years ago, um, Southeast Asia was not a good place to grow rice. There was a large drought in Southeast Asia. This is actually based on climate data from cave sampling in uh, uh, mainland Southeast Asia. And what you can see is this is, uh, this is the um, amount of precipitation. You can see that local rainfall starts to drop about 5,000 years ago in Southeast Asia and doesn't, oops, doesn't recover until about 3,200 uh, years ago. Um, so during this period of time, Southeast Asia, you could grow rice, but it probably was not a very good place to grow rice. It was only after 3,200 years ago, which coincides with our genomic analysis for when we think rice went into Southeast Asia. Also, there was another paper that was published recently that showed that many of the major rice growing areas in Southeast Asia, like the Mekong River Delta, and the Chao Phraya River Delta in Thailand and other areas in Southeast Asia they did not exist before 2,500 years ago. This was underwater. Um, this area was underwater 2,500 years ago. It was only after that period of time that this period emerged from the water. And that's where you begin to see rice actually show up in the archeology span of these areas. So even the, am the amount of land or the type of land used for rice farming in Southeast Asia didn't, wasn't there until about 2,500 years ago. So we think that both climate change also, um, as well as land changes in land formation was important for the movement of rice into Southeast Asia after 3000 years ago. 
So that's what we think is the dispersal model of rice. That's 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 our major uh, ideas on how uh, uh, tropical chaponica rice dispersed. Okay. Uh, but what about indica? Indica is the most important rice variety in the world. As I said, it's responsible for 80% of the wild rice production. What do we know about its dispersal? It turns out that indica, trying to understand the dispersal of indica um, is very difficult. At least it was difficult for us. Um, we were able to look at different subgroupings of indica rice, just what we did with japonica. Um, so uh, we're able to see, for example, rice varieties that were uh, uh, found in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is uh, the Indian, uh, Indian indica groups. Uh, and then this is Chinese indica, and this is uh, Southeast Asian groups. Um, but it, because what we find, and this doesn't show it as much, there's a lot of hybridization and gene flow between populations. And because we think indica spread much more recently, um, reconstructing the pattern of spread of indica is proving to be more difficult. And we think we need more higher resolution techniques to try to do that for indica. Uh, and in fact, the only thing uh, we're able to time here is the separation of indica between India and the Chinese and Southeast Asian indicas. So th that was the first split in our models that you know, it originated in India and at a certain amount of time, uh, it went to China and, main, and, and mainland Southeast Asia. And our timing says this occurred between 2000 and 1400 years ago. Um, that's when it occurred. And that's actually an interesting meter of time. We think Buddhism moved from in, India to China about 1900 years ago. So it may be that this is a period of time where there's a lot of cultural contact between India uh, and the rest of Asia. And in fact, we know all over Southeast Asia during this period, there was a large number of Hindu empires that stretch all the way to Bali and in the Philippines um, that uh, showed the movement of culture from India to the region. And we think, especially early on, this moved Indica to the region. Indica was so successful that as many of you know, it really displaced much of Japonica rice production in, uh, Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia and China in the last few hundred years. Um, so th that became an important part. But the other parts of this um, uh, story is still open. We still are not quite sure about the pattern of these stories. Oh, and by the way, Indica uh, shows up in the archeological record in central Thailand about 1,800 years ago. So again, the archeology span is uh, consistent with our genome analysis for when we think uh, Indica rice moved to Southeast Asia. Um, so that gives you, I think, uh, an overview for our story right now for how we think Japonica and Indica um, spread throughout Asia. Um, and, and this is something that we're continuing to work on. We're continuing to try to refine our understanding of Japonica rice. And we're also interested, of course, in trying to do it for Indica rice. Um, but for Indica, we, will, we, we actually need um, newer techniques newer computational techniques to do this analysis because the current techniques we have um, does not have the sufficient resolution to address this question. Okay, so that's the story of indica and japonica rice. Now, I know that many of you are interested in aromatic rice or the basmati rices. Um, they are the, one of the highest priced rice um, subspecies or variety groups. In the world, they are of course associated primarily with India or the Indian subcontinent with a little bit in um, uh, Southeast Asia as well. Um, and a few years, uh, well, not a few years ago, just last year, we had the opportunity to work with Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies asked, um, said that uh, they had developed methods for long read sequencing based on their Nanopore platform. Uh, and they wanted to test it and said, well, you know, if I were to choose a rice variety to test it in, I would choose basmati rice uh, or the aromatic rices to do it from because it's, of course, it's one of the quintessential um, rice varieties. And we chose um, two varieties, basmati 334, and we chose uh, a sadri rice from Iran, Dom Sufid, which is, of course, an aromatic rice to look at. We looked at both of these. Basmati 334 is interesting. It actually doesn't have the aromatic gene, um, but it's considered a basmati. But the reason we chose it is that there's been a lot of interest in Basmati 334 because 
of um, some of its features in, especially in, in uh, 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 biotic uh, stress resistance. Uh, and so we did a sequencing of um, um, these two rice varieties. We released it um, last year in genome biology and it's available and I can share it. It's publicly available. Um, what we found about basmati rice is something that people had suggested for a long time. I'm not gonna go through the data with you, but we think it's a hybrid, it's, it's, it's a hybrid uh, variety between Aush and Basmati. Um, our data suggests, our, and we have many different lines of evidence to suggest that it is a hybridization between uh, Aush and Basmati that gave rise to, um, um, to uh, uh, the Basmati, the, what we now know call the circumbasmati group. Um, so again, hybridization is an important, um, is an important issue in this question of the evolution of this major important group of rice. We also were able to look at the population structure of Basmati. I mean, we didn't go very deeply into it uh, from the principal component analysis. We basically resequenced several Basmati uh, rice uh, uh, groups from different parts of uh, uh, South uh, Asia primarily. Uh, you can see the groupings here and you can see there seems to be different phenotypic differences between them. We are not expert on basmati rices. Um, your group in India is probably way more uh, sophisticated in their understanding of basmati rice. Uh, and so it would be, this is another area that would be interesting to look at in the future, um, to look more closely at the evolution and spread of basmati rice. And especially some of its major characteristics are important um, for the highly prized nature of this uh, subspecies of rice. So to summarize um, this part, uh, this talk, um, there are several things that I think we begin to learn about the evolution of rice. One is that the importance of hybridization and introgression as key elements in the evolution of rice subspecies. And here we see indica and marsamati as examples. We see that the most prized varieties of rice or the most important uh, uh, subspecies such as indica came about because of hybridization and introgression um, with other populations. And, and I think that this is a theme that is now beginning to be seen in other rice, I'm sorry, not only in rice, but in other crops as well. We're beginning to see this in date palms, in apples, uh, and in other uh, types of important, uh, of course, in wheat, um, that hybridization and integration are important elements in how these rice, how these crop species are evolving. We think that climate change is an important factor in the evolution of rice. The dispersal and diversification of chapotica rice associated with the um, 2.5 climate event uh, that lowered global temperatures uh, and the diversification of rice in Southeast Asia uh, with a mega drought associated uh, with the Holocene mega drought that ended about 3,200 years ago. And one of the lessons that, uh, one of the things that I still want to emphasize is there are still a lot of things we don't know and indica remains a big mystery and an important mystery um, that uh, we would like to work with uh, in the next few years. Um, so where, where are we going next few years? Um, so one of the things is we want to continue to refine our understanding of japonica rice. If you look at this map, one of the things you'll notice if you look at this map, how little we have sampled from China and the reason we have very little sampling from China is because indica was so successful in China that they have very little japonica land races left. They no longer really cultivate japonica rice. Um, so, you know, but of course, China is an important aspect of the story. Uh, and so we were trying to wonder where, where are we gonna get samples of japonica land races in China? And what we decided to do was we go back to herbarium because of course, in the herbariums around the world, they have samples of herbarium specimens from China that were collected 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And we can collect DNA from these herbarium samples and sequence them and get an indication of Japonica land races in China 100 years ago. The other th good thing about this is that these herbarium specimens have very good geographic information. They can tell you specifically where these samples were collected. So we can know precisely on the map where these samples are from. So we're actually engaged in this right now. We have collected about 100 
Japonica uh, land races from China and Southeast Asia in the New York Botanical Garden and the Harvard Herbarium Smithsonian in London, the Natural History Museum and the Key Botanic Gardens. Um, there's a good collection in Paris as well. We haven't sampled that yet. We hope to sample that after the pandemic, uh, but that's one thing we're doing. Uh, and I have a graduate student uh, uh, who's uh, focusing on this project. And already the samples we already have has increased our sampling, for example, in China. Um, these show you now where the herbarium specimens we have. We now have better sampling in Japan, in China, and in Southeast Asia, especially in China um, from these uh, herbarium specimens. And so we hope that that will allow us to continue our work in refining the story of the spread of Japonica. As I mentioned, indica rice, an important uh, question. Uh, we would like to work on indica rice. We actually have a lot of samples of indica rice um, from the 3 k genome project. It's just that the methods to analyze the data are not at a sufficiently high resolution to be useful to us. And so we have to think very carefully how we're going to do this. Um, and as I said in the beginning, what are we doing? Are we just trying to tell the history of rice? Yes, we are trying to tell the history of rice because as many of you know, a lot of the history of rice is part of the history of Asia and the history of the world. So we're interested in doing that. But really one of the reasons we're doing that too, as I mentioned earlier, is we want to see how has past climate change affected adaptation of rice uh, today? And also how, uh, as rice spread to different environments, how they have adapted to different environments as they've done their spread. And we think by understanding this, we can find genes that help rice adapt to different environments and use those genes to help breeders in understanding and, and to develop in new varieties for the future, especially in the face, as you know, of critical climate change uh, throughout the world. So with that, I'd like to thank a lot of people uh, who did this work. Um, much of the work I presented is work by J.M. Choi and Rafael Guttaker, two postdocs in the lab. Jay is still a postdoc in the lab. Rafael Guttaker is now a group leader at the Kew Botanic Gardens in the United Kingdom. Um, and there are a lot of people who have been involved in this work, uh, who are in my lab, who are involved in different aspects of work in my lab, as well as people in the past who have been uh, involved in our work on rice. Uh, and uh, also I have been working with a large number of collaborators in these projects uh, throughout the world um, and uh, I hope to add to this list, maybe from NR NRRI, uh, of these list of collaborators who can help us try to understand the evolution of rice um, in the world. Uh, and also I'd like to thank uh, our funders, the Zegar Family Foundation, uh, who have been uh, strong supporters of us in this project and the US National Science Foundation Plant Genome Research Program. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. And of course, I have time to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your wonderful talk. And it was really, we have uh, gone through uh, uh, starting from history to the current and how they have evolved and they have spread all over the world and how they are controlling to um, impact into world food security. So yeah, yeah, it was very nice to know that uh, global cooling impacted rice evolution, especially, uh, especially the temperate Japonica. Uh, you mentioned many of things, uh, and uh, I think that have already cleared our many uh, doubt about evolution and spread of different uh, subspecies of rice. But I believe still um, the audience have several questions as they have. I see they have already written down in the chat box, so I can one by one go through those questions. Uh, they would like to have your insight on those aspects. So the first question is asked by Pritesh uh, from our institute. He asks, uh, we have generated ample of admixtures in different population studies, which have not been utilized till date. Is not it reasonable to analyze those variations available in admixture group which may provide an insight into the evolution. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very good area of research. Um, we're not able to do that in your work. But, you know, the, being able to synthesize some of these 
um, you know, synthesize some of these uh, hybrids, and then looking at their um, uh, looking at their characteristics may give us evidence or provide us with with, with insight into the evolution of crops. Um, I know, for example, that in sunflower, this was important in understanding sunflower evolution, um, but it hasn't been done in any other crop species. And, you know, a place like NRRI or other places that are able to do this may be able to contribute into our understanding of these early hybridization events that gave rise to, to, to our major subspecies right now. And I think that's a really exciting area of research. Thank you. So the next question is from uh, Paramasharan, who is also uh, working as a scientist, and he is really interested in this uh, kind of evolution, evolutionary studies. So he said, uh, may I know how genetically diverse is Proto-Indica and wild ancestors of Japonica? Uh, we unfortunately don't know that. Um, I, my lab is primarily focused on Japonica, so actually our understanding of Indica is not very deep. Um, so, so, so I, so the, the answer to that is, I don't know. Uh, Japonica is relatively diverse. The problem with, Jap I'm sorry, the wild ancestor of Japonica. Um, I, I wonder if you meant the Japonica that came to India and is hybridized with the proto-Indica. That we don't know, but again, more genetic studies of Indica might be able to tell us that um, by looking at the introgress regions from Japonica into Indica and looking at how genetically diverse they are. Uh, actually, that's another interesting area of study that can be done um, to do. So that's an open question. Yeah, okay, thank you. So he has another two questions. <laughs> Let me just narrate that. So one is, does non-availability of genetic data from India affects the rice origin hypothesis? This is one. Yeah, I mean, if you have, if you have, um, gaps in your sampling that will really affect the, 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 you know, the question. And for, for India, there's actually relatively good sampling based on um, the available land races at, um, at the, uh, the International Rice Research Institute. But for example, as you saw in China, the, um, we actually have very little good, not great sampling of Japonica, and we had to go to herbarium specimens. Um, but I, I see there's another question about how regional and country level studies can add to this question, which has something to do with the, with sampling, for example, in India. And I think it would have a very, it, it will help either refine our understanding or maybe even change our understanding. Um, uh, and and that, that the, 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 the picture I'm presenting you is kind of a very broad picture based on very broad sampling across Asia. But as people look at specific regions and specific countries, um, it may be possible to get even better resolution uh, of what's going on. And we've seen that happen in human genetic studies, right? Where, you know, once they looked at, uh, you know, this part, of, look at India more specifically, or look at Southeast Asia more specifically, they're able to refine their understanding of human spread uh, in those areas. Um, we're actually, for example, doing a study right now, which we're about to submit the paper, uh, looking at Taiwan um, before, and, and it, this is an example of that, where looking at a country more specifically, in this case, Taiwan and the Northern Philippines at a, a deeper level has, it didn't change our understanding, but it refined our idea of how rice spread in Southeast Asia. And I think more studies like that are going to be important in the future. So there's a lot more to do in this area. Um, going forward. Yeah, so the next question uh, is from Ridul Chakravarti. He asks, uh, the O. Nevada, Zoraja Nevada route is not considered for evolution of Indica rice. So that's his question, but he also commented that at least one or few adaptation relative genes completely absent or null in Japonica are found only in Nevada and Indica. Yeah, no, so, so, so when we met wild rice in, in India, we think it's Navara. I think there's good evidence that Indica comes from Navara. Um, the, the question about Navara is that what is it? Is it a really separate species from Rufipogon or is it an ecotype of Rufipogon? So I think that it's not clear whether Navara is its own distinct species or it's an ecotype of Rufipogon, but what is clear, it's very, very close to Rufipogon. Uh, and, it, and so if, 
it, Proto Indica most likely came from Horizon uh, uh, Ruf, uh, Nevara uh, and not Rufa Pogon. So I agree with that completely. Um, Okay, so another question from Shiva Prashad. Uh, he asked about artifacts of rice grain excavated from Harappa and uh, Indus Valley civilization in India. Uh, it's around uh, 3500 uh, BC. And uh, what is your comments with regards to age of domestication of Indica rice? Yeah, so, so, so that, it, it's actually the Harappan rice. It, it, so this is this was surprised me, and when I talked to archaeologists, um, again I'm not an archaeologist, but I'm just relaying what I've learned from talking to archaeology colleagues about this. When 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 Japonica, the rice grains at first appear in large quantities. I, I that was surprising to me because of course I would have th I thought it would have come from the northeast, um, but it came from the northwest um, about two as you said two thousand five hundred BC, which you know, we think that it was 4,500 years ago or 2,500 BC when you start to see Indica suddenly rise in India. So um, the, the, we think that what happened was Japonica went through the Silk Route around the Tibetan Plateau and into the Northwest. Um, and one of the reasons for that, according to the archeologists is that the same time that you see the, these rice appear in the Harappan region, you also start to see tools and implements uh, that seem to be influenced by, China, by the Chinese. So we think that that came in as a package. Uh, and then what the, 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 those in the Indian subcontinent did is they just didn't accept that rice that came in and essentially did experiments. They hybridized it with what they had, or um, we don't know, of course, how they did it, but they, 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 they mixed the two and they gave rice to this new essentially a super subspecies indica. Um, but yeah, it's true that we think it's for the Northwest and the Harappan area that it came in. And that's Michael, important in our understanding of- Michael, lecture you told that uh, right, indica rice is uh, 1500 BC, not very old. Oh, yeah, it's 1500 BC. So there might've been a lag time but then. Uh, this valley is around 5,500 at least, maybe more. Yeah, the one that we, that the, the, the date that I've been told um, by Dorian is probably around 4,500 years ago. I think we skipped more. 4,500. What? What? 3,500 BC. 3,500 BC in the Oh, then, then we'll have, I mean, then we'll have to take another look at when we think these events occurred. Um, but from again, I'm not an archaeologist, but from, from what my understanding is, sometime 4,500, 5,000 years ago, that's when you start to see Japonica come in. Um, and then after that is when you start to see rice, indica rice, really shoot up in the archaeological record in, in a lar large quantities. Um, but especially in the Indian subcontinent, I mean, the archaeology is continuing to refine those dates as to when they, they come. One of the things that we haven't done is look at the genomic data to date the introgression. Um, and there are ways to do that. So that may be something to think about. Okay, thank you. So now, uh, so as we have an audience of uh, one of the uh, very well-known uh, scientists from India, Professor Casey Bonsell, is now acting as a senior advisor, Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. And he was also the former director of a National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. That's the National Gene Bank of India. So uh, he was the director of that. So he has some general comment and questions for you. He will directly ask you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, thank you, Puto. Excellent presentation which I thoroughly enjoyed, Dr. Michael. And just to, you know, talk about a little bit, I think it was a, an excellent account on the dispersal models. You talked about Japonica and, you know, Indica rice particularly. And I was wondering whether, you know, any of these, particularly Japonica is related to having some kind of genes for thermotolerance and, uh, and Indica rice probably having some genes 
you know, locked up there for, for drought tolerance. Is that correct? Based on your dispersal models, I, I just, you know, a little bit trying to analyze, you know, that this could be one of the, you know, repositories of uh, some of these genes in, in these land races of Japonica versus Indica. And uh, further yeah. to add, to your presentation, you know, when you talked about 3,010 accessions, you know, which were sequenced, of course, we have the data available just to inform the audience and you particularly that out of 3,010, 400 were from India, which were, you know, in the every gene bank. Out of, we have about 105,000 accessions, you know, the largest number ever in any nation we have in India, you know, in, in case of rice in the National Gene Bank here. So I think it is given a very good account, but I hope that you will be able to collaborate in future more with, with Indian scientists, particularly the scientists from National Rice Research Institute, you know, who is currently hosting you for this particular lecture to have more, you know, insightful gains into scientific, you know, insights into the Indica rice compared to Japonica. Because for us, it is more important to have more, you know, detailed studies on Indica rice, because that's one which we grow most of the time here in India. So this is in general, I thought, but I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I was uh, elsewhere busy, but thanks to Dr. Kutub, Dr. Methi, you know, particularly for giving me this chance and inviting me to this you know, presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was an excellent account, which I heard about you today. Well, thank you very much. That, 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 that means a lot. Um, absolutely, I, 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 you, you, you're right. In, in, in all the countries, the sampling, um, as I said, is very broad. And I think there's the, the story of Indica rice it's not yet, it, it, it's, it, it's not even incomplete, it's very incomplete. Um, there's a lot to be learned about that. And collaborating with um, India and in trying to understand that, I think uh, is going to be uh, important uh, in doing that. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely open to try to think of ways uh, to do that. It, it, it will have to be a, a collab, not a collaborator, but a project like that is, is not only, as I said, an, a problem of samples, but also a problem of techniques, because I think Indica is much more complicated than Japonica. Um, and so we may have to develop new analytical techniques or borrow new analytical techniques from human genetics to do that. So that's the question. The first question is, that's exactly the reason. Actually, the reason we're doing that, as I said, it, it's not only to look at the history. We want them to figure out what genes allowed them to be adapted to cold tolerance, to drought tolerance? Um, how did Southeast Asian rice survive the Holocene mega drought? Or the, there was a drought, I think, like in 1500 uh, uh, um, for several years. How did it survive that? Can we find the genes that allowed those varieties to survive that and use that uh, in the future? That's actually our ultimate goal. Um, and what we're doing is we think before we do that, we want to first help uh, reconstruct um, uh, the evolution of rice before we can find those genes. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, we, we didn't do that here, but in our study of Taiwanese, and we did the rice of Taiwan, which is the indigenous rice grown in the mountains of Taiwan, and the rice terraces in the Philippines, which are very close to each other. Um, we just wrote that, and then we actually looked for which genes were selected in those areas. And one gene was a gene that's responsible for UV tolerance, for example. Um, which might make sense given its higher altitude. I don't know, but it's, it was interesting to us. Uh, and so, you know, so those are the kinds of things we want to do. Um, I gradually have a graduate student now who's focusing on Japonica rice and to look for the genes under selection in Japonica rice. The, the Indica rice is going to be much more important, as I said, because it is the important rice subspecies in the world. And so that's still a big, big open question. Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, very much. Thank you. So thank you. I think uh, we have uh, we had a lot of discussion and a wonderful discussion, enjoyable discussion. Everyone enjoyed, I guess. And uh, now it's time for presidential remark from the chair of this session, Dr. D. Mighty, Director of National Rice Research Institute. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kutub. Uh, very good morning to Professor Michael Purganan and all others from the same time zone and very good evening to one and all from this time zone. So, re respected Professor Michael Purganan, the Silver Professor of Biology Center for Genomics and Systems Biology, New York University, USA, the August gathering on virtual platform, the senior officials from ICR headquarters, 
the honorable de delegates who are attending this uh, virtual seminar my colleagues of national rice research institute and other institutions students ladies and gentlemen it is really my great privilege to listen to professor michael the world renowned scientist working on plant evolutionary genomics and to be with you all as you all know professor michael's area of research are plant evolutionary genomics and domestication and evolution of crop species with special reference to rice the area of crop evolutionary genomics is very relevant and has intrinsic significance for in depth investigation of gene flow required for effective genetic manipulation for crop improvement particularly for a crop like rice which is grown in widest geographical location of the globe comprising several contrasting ecologies as you all know it is cultivated in as far north of about 53 degree north on the border between russia and china and as far south as central argentina of 40 degree south it is grown in cool climates in the mountains of nepal and india and under irrigation in the hot deserts of iran and egypt it is also grown as upland crops in parts of asia africa and latin america at the other environmental extremes also are floating rice which thrives in seasonally deeply flooded areas such as river deltas of mekong in vietnam and the ganges brahmaputra basins in eastern india and bangladesh so we can imagine so there is something problem okay. you're not audible oh just a minute okay now now you are audible sir okay 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 yeah. so we are over hand to listen to you a such a thoughtful thought provoking deliberation on latest concepts of origin and fate of rice from you professor michel which has provided new insights to the whole audience as i understand and created an atmosphere of knowledge for which i think we all need to absorb the depth of information for proper intense thinking on it and uh, we are really interested and keen on having collaboration with you professor michael particularly on the issues of unanswered uh, questions about the origin and spread of indiga rice which is more important for the whole world so at this moment i intend to stop here now to keep the pulsation on thank you very much professor michael and thank you all thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much as well this was a i i really enjoyed um, interacting with my indian colleagues even remotely okay so uh, now you know uh, as per the schedule this is the time for vote of thanks and i would request dr sutha pasarka uh, who is the member of platinum jubilee lecture series organizing committee so uh, sutha pa madam please for your vote of thanks A very good evening to all. Uh, I, on behalf of the entire National Rice Research Institute fraternity, extend my heartiest congratulations for delivering a mesmerizing talk on the origin of rice and its spread across the globe to Professor Michael uh, Purubam Sir. The talk was highly educating and a learning experience throughout. the art of telling the story of rice substantiated with the scientific evidences and the new story connecting links could really reach our interest to search on the hidden mysteries and the unknown connecting links of the origin of rice the evolution of rice the 4.2k event the 
sudden uh, fall in temperature and the divergence of tropical and temperate Japonica was really interesting and could trigger my search into this area also. I, on behalf of my institute, also extend my heart of gratitude for accepting our invitation on the occasion of our Platinum Jubilee Foundation Day series of lectures. Thank you, Purugunam uh, sir. Thank you, for, uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and enlightening us, enlightening the scientific mind, minds at our institute. Thank you, sir. There are, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to our beloved dear sir, Dr. Pankaiti sir, for being a source of continuous encouragement for arranging these series of lectures on the occasion of the Platinum Jubilee celebration. You, you are muted. Sutapati, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. muted. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. There also I would like to thank the distinguished audience, Dr. Bansal sir, Dr. Anita Karun, and all other distinguished scientists who joined our institute, research institutes, as well as the other institutes in India. The researchers and scholars at National Rice Research Institute for this learning event and actively participating to make a great success. Then I would like to thank the chairman of the committee, Dr. B.C. Patra, sir, of the Platinum Jubi Lecture Series Committee and all other committee members, Dr. Kutu, Dr. Mahanta, for helping us, for conducting and cooperating with us for arranging this lecture series. I would like to thank Mr. Santosh for arranging and joining us, creating the Zoom link for this lecture series and could join us at, uh, uh, throughout the globe. Uh, means we are sitting uh, at India and then you are sitting at New York uh, crossing the timeline also. Thank you, Mr. Santosh. And I would like to thank one and all for uh, joining us for this mega event. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Michael. Thank you. Professor thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. And as I said, I hope to visit NRRI sometime. No, we, we, we will be eagerly waiting for receiving you over here and okay. have discussions. So thank, thank you, you and have a good thank evening to everyone. And uh, we'll see each other around. Okay, bye. Good night. Bye. bye. Okay, so we, we end here, so you can leave the meeting. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you, Kutub. Thank you, sir. Good night. Abhi, Abhi ghar jana hai, sir. <laughs> <laughs>